In this keynote um, today, I'd like to talk a bit about the potential of cultural linguistics as a general framework, both a theoretical framework and an analytical framework for the study of pragmatic meaning. In particular, I'd like to um, elaborate on how cultural linguistics can be employed to examine um, the cultural underpinnings of uh, certain speech acts. Um, first, I'd like to talk a bit about pragmatics and the study of culture in relation to pragmatics. Um, there were three traditions, at least, within pragmatics that have focused on um, the role of culture and the study of pragmatics. And here I'm referring to the uh, work by um, Anna Trostborg um, in the book Pragmatics Across Languages and Cultures. Um, Trostborg talks about um, three traditions, contrastive pragmatics, cross-cultural pragmatics, and intercultural pragmatics. When she talks about contrastive pragmatics, she refers to those studies of traditional studies within the paradigm of contrastive linguistics where people focused on L1, L2 comparison, and the notion of interlanguage pragmatics and negative transfer. So basically, pragmatic differences across languages were seen to be linguistic phenomenon and not so much of uh, cultural in nature. Cross-cultural pragmatics refers to studies of uh, pragmatic um, speech acts where um, people looked at different speech acts in different languages. For example, um, request in Hebrew versus English. They looked at these speech acts and their realizations in different languages separately and then compared them with each other. I'll talk a bit about this um, further. The third tradition, which is called intercultural pragmatics, focuses on intercultural interaction between people from different cultural backgrounds. So they look at really pragmatic differences across languages, but um, the focus is on interaction between interlocutors coming from different linguistic and cultural backgrounds. This is more of a recent tradition, if you like. Cross-cultural pragmatics um, focused on pragmatic differences and differences in the realizations and enactment of speech acts. Um, and they focused on how far these differences in speech acts reflected cultural values. And by cultural values, they, they, they meant values such as directness, solidarity, social harmony, sincerity, intimacy, assertiveness, cordiality, and self-expression. So the idea was that differences in the ways in which a speech act such as request is enacted in different languages would reflect, for example, the degrees to which people can directly ask for um, requests Anna Wierspitzka um, criticizes this tradition and she says when one compares the ways in which different um, writers use these terms such as intimacy, directness, solidarity, she says it becomes obvious that they don't mean the same thing for everybody. Wierspitzka has always warned us about the danger of using English and English terminology in, in looking at cultural um, values and norms. So um, it's as if directness is a concept that exists in all languages in exactly the same um, range of concepts. Now, back to cultural linguistics. First, I would like to give a definition of cultural linguistics. Cultural linguistics is a multidisciplinary area of research that explores the relationship between language and cultural conceptualizations. In particular, cultural conceptualizations um, 
that underpin certain features of human languages. So cultural linguistics explores features of human languages that encode culturally constructed conceptualizations of experience. For cultural linguistics, certain features of human languages are repositories of cultural conceptualizations that have coalesced at different stages in the history of speech communities, and these can leave traces in current linguistic practice. For cultural linguistics, interactions at the macro and micro levels of speech community continuously can act to reshape pre-existing cultural conceptualizations and bring new ones in. Why cultural linguistics? What's the need for cultural linguistics? Um, different traditions within linguistics, such as so social linguistics, have explored social variables and their en encoding of um, social variables in language, such as gender and, and socioeconomic um, level. But I think there is a need for a theoretical and an analytical framework that explores features of human languages that encode culturally grounded conceptualizations of experience. Um, and cultural linguistics um, tries to achieve this aim by focusing on not so much of the abstract notion of culture, which has been criticized so much in, in the past, but on the notion, a specific notion of cultural conceptualizations. Often people have shied away and moved away from the concept of culture because of its essentialist forces and because of the stereotype tendencies of the abstract notion of culture. But cultural linguistics focuses, as I said, on a, a specific type of construct which is called cultural conceptualizations rather than the general notion of um, culture. Cultural linguistics has been applied to areas of applied linguistics such as intercultural communication, um, cross-cultural pragmatics, world Englishes, teaching English as an international language. I'll be talking about this a bit later and political discourse analysis as well. Um, the theoretical basis of cultural linguistics relies on what I have called cultural cognition. Now, cultural cognition um, is very much in line with notions of cognition that are broader than the individual cognition. Because I think when you talk about cultural conceptualizations and language, you need a level of cognition that is broader than just the level of individual cognition. And while I was developing this notion of cultural cognition, I realized that in cognitive sciences, there was a paradigm shift from the individual notion of cognition, or what may be referred to as between the ears view of cognition, to um, what could be called the emergent or extended view of cognition, which have also been termed inactive, inactive or embodied cognition. Um, I have explained this um, in detail in, in my writings, um, and I will just touch upon this notion um, a bit further. What, what is important for me is to focus on how social and linguistic interaction serves as the key to the development of cultural cognition. So this is where I think the role of language in developing um, higher levels of cognition has not been adequately examined. And I have also drawn on the field of distributed cognition um, to gain a better understanding of cultural cognition as a form of what they call distributed cognition. But of, of course, I have called it heterogeneously distributed cognition. Now, cultural cognition emerges 
from the group level social and linguistic interactions between um, the members of a speech community, but, but they do not define groups. So this is where cultural linguistics is moving away from essentializing groups of people and speakers. Cultural conceptualizations form as a result of linguistic and social interactions, but as I said, they don't define individual speakers. And of course, with globalization when, and, and um, ultra-cultural mobility of people, now speakers may draw on more than one system of cultural cognition based on their contact experiences. Um, for me, cultural cognition, as I said, is a, is a form of heterogeneous um, distributed cognition. The notion of heterogeneous distributions is, is very vital and of key importance to, to cultural linguistics and the notion of cultural cognition. Cultural cognition is not equally imprinted in the minds of the speakers across a speech community. And so cultural cognition is not equally shared between the members of a speech community, although the members of the speech community may often assume that this cultural level of cognition is shared. I think the notion of heterogeneous distributions can provide a very strong analytical tool for the negotiations of meanings. And also, it accounts for misunderstandings and miscommunications. If cultural cognition was equally and homogeneously shared between the members of a speech community, there would be no misunderstanding and miscommunication between the members of the group. Now, in, in, in this diagram, I've tried to capture the notion of heterogeneous distribution um, as it relates to the notion of cultural cognition. So you can see in this diagram that I have um, thought about two levels. One is the emergent level, and this is the technical notion of emergent, where what emerges from the local interactions is more than just the sum of the individual parts. And the local level is the heterogeneous distribution, where the elements of the emergent level are not equally shared between the units at the local, if you like, level. This is also another sketch of the notion of distributed emergent cultural cognition, where I have tried to show that the interactions between the individual units at the local level, at the level where we have heterogeneous distributions, can lead to the emergence of the top level or the macro level of the emergent level of cultural cognition. But then again, this cultural cognition also feeds into the interactions of the individual members. So the social and interaction, the social and linguistic interactions of the individuals at the local level uh, lead to the emergence of the macro level of the emergent level of cultural cognition. But again, cultural cognition can guide the linguistic and social interactions of the individuals. So it's a kind of a um, double way cause and effect, if you like. There are two aspects to cultural cognitions in this model. One of them is cultural conceptualizations, and the second one is language. And they're very closely related. In terms of the relationship between language and cultural conceptualizations, I believe language is very much entrenched in cultural conceptualizations. And there are units of cultural conceptualizations that are very much closely associated with certain features of languages. And these 
units of cultural conceptualizations include cultural schemas, which in cognitive anthropology, they refer to them as cultural models, and also cultural cognitive categories, and what is known as cultural conceptual metaphors. This model and the whole relationship between cultural cognition, cultural conceptualizations, and language may be best captured in this diagram where you have at the background the, the bigger, um, the macro level of cultural cognition, and then you've got cultural conceptualizations, and then you have aspects of language that are entrenched, as I said, in cultural conceptualizations. As you can see, I have tried to show um, that the units of cultural conceptualizations, such as cultural schemas, cultural categories, and cultural metaphors, may be closely associated with features of the language. Or, if you like, they encode um, the features of the language, encode these cultural conceptualizations. And features may be morphosyntactic features, semantic meaning, pragmatic meaning, but also discourse structure. Cultural conceptualizations are dynamic and negotiated and renegotiated by speakers across time and space. So unlike the essentialist notion of culture where people were imprisoned in um, what was thought to be the culture, cultural conceptualizations are, are very dynamic. In fact, language may not change as fast as cultural conceptualizations. And often, there is a kind of causal relationship between cultural conceptualizations and language in, in, in the sense that often changes in cultural conceptualizations serve as the motivation for language change. So, for example, a particular cultural schema or cultural category falls out of favor or use. Therefore, the word, the linguistic um, enactment of, of that particular cultural schema or cultural category is no longer needed by the speech community. So in time, first, the cultural conceptualization changes, but it takes a bit of time for language to follow, and then the word disappears from the current uh, active use by um, the speakers. And also cultural conceptualizations respond faster to contact than language. For language contact to, to take effect in terms of borrowing, um, the history of language contact needs to be significant, whereas cultural conceptualizations, people um, coming together, drawing on various systems of cultural conceptualizations, can, um, in a relatively shorter period of time, can develop competencies and awareness and familiarities with cultural conceptualizations. Here, I'd like to give you an example of what specifically I'm, I'm talking about in terms of cultural conceptualizations. This is an example from my research on Aboriginal English, the variety of English spoken by indigenous Australians. In Australian English, you would say, this land is mine. Land is conceptualized as commodity that can be bought, that can be sold, can be um, passed on from one individual to another one. But in the Aboriginal worldview, um, the land is conceptualized differently. The land is conceptualized as embodying the ancestor spirits. The ancestor spirits in what they called the dream time created the land and they became part of the land. And because ancestor beings are part of the land, and because I am part of my ancestor beings, therefore, I consider myself as part of the land. Therefore, this land is me rather than this land is mine. Often, Aboriginal English speakers say, the land owns me, because the land embodies the spirit of ancestor beings. How can I own the land? The land has always been here. As you can see here, 
The difference between these two sentences is a, is a grammatical difference. Mine as opposed to me. But the difference can only be accounted for if you focus on cultural conceptualizations, underlying cultural conceptualizations that clothe, if you like, the Aboriginal worldview. Examples of what I call cultural conceptual metaphors are when we use our body parts to conceptualize more abstract domains of experience such as emotions. In the book that I edited with my colleagues, which we called it Culture, Body and Language, we, we focused, we invited scholars to explore conceptualizations of internal body organs and the ways in which these internal body organs serve as conceptual domains for abstract um, domains of experience such as emotions. The, the obvious example is in English, for example, um, you say you broke my heart, which reflects the underlying conceptualization of heart as the seat of emotion. In Indonesian, interestingly, the notion of hati, which means liver, is the seat of emotions. And the author of the chapter in that book that talks about hati believes that this comes from the traditional notion of liver divination in the Indonesian culture. In some Aboriginal languages, um, belly is conceptualized as the seat of emotions. And in one of the Aboriginal languages that I know, um, throat is associated with romantic love rather than the heart. My own work focused on uh, the notion of del in Persian and how del is conceptualized as the seat of emotions, personality traits, thoughts, memories, and a lot more. And of course, as we know, it's very complicated because physically del refers to, to abdomen, but figuratively del refers to the heart. And, and del is extremely productive in Persian. And I, I believe um, if you want to understand the notion of del, uh, you have to go back to Persian literature and the influence of mystic traditions on Persian literature where del is very much associated with notions such as nafs. Examples of cultural categories. Kinship, I mean, food is one area, but kinship is a fascinating area where we can see traces of cultural categories. Aboriginal languages of Australia are extremely complex in terms of encoding kinship. For example, in Aboriginal English, the word mum um, is often used to refer to women of mother's generation, one's mother's generation, such as auntie. So one's auntie is called mum as well. And this is not just random, or it's not just as some people would like to believe. It's just simply a feature of language. There are some certain cultural schemas associated with the roles and responsibilities of this person um, who is biologically the auntie of the person in terms of the upbringing of the individual. That's why the person refers to the um, mother sister as mom. Interestingly, in certain cases, I have been told that even one's biological uncle can be referred to as mom as well. Examples of cultural schemas. In many cases, lexical items and um, lexical expressions encode cultural schemas. Just to give you some examples from, from English, the notion of personal space and privacy. And I'm not talking about what would be translated in Persian as khalvat, but we're talking about individuals' right to space and privacy in terms of information, what is private life, 
So there are cultural schemas about, in various um, speech communities, there are cultural schemas about what is considered to be private life and what is considered to be the intrusion of the private life. And, and interestingly, in several speech communities that I know, the word privacy does not even exist because historically and culturally, the notion of privacy as it is conceptualized in Western cultures has not developed. And so in recent times, when they need the concept of privacy, for many reasons, for example, the use of technology is now the word privacy is all over the new technology and you need it. They have borrowed the word from English and they tried it to localize it. And for example, in Japanese and Korean, they uh, I know my pronunciation is not exactly correct, but, but they, they um, borrow the word and turn it into a Japanese or a Korean word. And interestingly, some of these cultural schemas, such as privacy and personal space, historically, we know historically they have been developed in, the, in, in Western countries, and they have become even legalized in the sense that an intrusion of privacy can lead to legal consequences for the individual. And so these, these I think, have very significant consequences for multicultural societies where people draw on various cultural schemas, but they seem to be speaking the same language such as English. An example, a very good example from Aboriginal English. Um, I, I conducted my uh, PhD study on, on the cultural schemas that Aboriginal children drew on when speaking English, and one of the very interesting ones was the notion of home for the Aboriginal child. Home was wherever a member of the extended family lived. So auntie's house was also referred to as home. Grandmother's house was referred to as home. And this conceptualization of home had significant consequences in terms of miscommunication with the school for Aboriginal children, obviously disadvantaging Aboriginal students. In terms of the application of cultural linguistics, in 2007, um, I edited a book with Gary Palmer, and we called it Applied Cultural Linguistics. And that was the beginning of the time when we focused on um, giving directions to cultural linguistics in terms of its potential to be applied to certain areas such as, as I said before, world English's intercultural communication, pragmatics, and teaching English as an international language. Now, I'd like to focus on cultural linguistics and pragmatics, which is the main aim of this keynote. Cultural linguistics views meaning in terms of cult uh, conceptualization, as I mentioned before, and conceptualizations that are linguistic, linguistically encoded are in many cases culturally constructed. And of course, pragmatic meaning is no exception. During linguistic interactions, various utterances in association with different speech acts are interpreted on the basis of what we call inference in pragmatics. And of course, <clears throat> the whole notion of inference depends upon cognitive schemas which interlocutors perceive to be more or less shared. So we, we infer from speech acts certain meanings. These are pragmatic meanings. But the inference comes from the assumption of shared schemas. So that's, in other words, pragmatic meaning is a matter of what is perceived to be shared cultural schemas. Now, I have tried to 
come up with a particular working scheme for the study of pragmatic meaning in Persian. This is very, of course, preliminary, but I think this might be perceived to be um, a good starting point. If, if you think of the macro level schema of what we call adab, then I think there are certain schemas, there are certain cultural schemas that we can view to be so much embedded within this macrocultural scheme of adab. And these include the cultural scheme of Tarof, the cultural scheme of Rudar Bayesti, Sharmandegi, Shekastanafsi, Oberu, and so on. <clears throat> I'll talk about each one briefly, just to give you examples. Now, as we know, the cultural scheme of Tarof is very much at the heart of social interactions in, among Persian speakers. It's very interesting that um, electronic encyclopedias such as Wikipedia and dictionaries such as Urban Dictionary have got entries focusing on Tarof specifically. And they all view Tarof to be a Persian concept specifically Persian concept, as you can see from um, the brief definitions that I have provided here. So there are a lot of websites and blogs where speakers of Persian positively or negatively talk about Tarov and various um, ways in which Tarov is reflected in the interactions between speakers of Persian. Even now, I have seen blogs where American English speakers um, talk about certain things and then they say, and this is no tarof as Persians would call it. It's very interesting that they are becoming more and more aware of this cultural schema due to the existence of diaspora speakers of Persian, uh, particularly in the United States. There has always, there, ha, there, ha, there has also been scholarly research um, on this concept of Torah. And I'm um, here referring to the work of uh, people like Asjadi, Asadi, Islamir Asikh, um, Izadi, Hillman, Hodge, Kutlaki, etc. So there's a vast literature on, on the concept of Torah. But I, I have tried to be very specific about Torah and its relationship to certain speech acts in Persian. I think the general aim of the cultural scheme of Tarof is to create a kind of social space for, for speakers to exercise face work, politeness, to project certain social identities and personas, and also to provide communicative tools to negotiate and, and lubricate social relationships. Also, I think this cultural schema affords a chance for the interlocutors to, to construct certain identities and images of themselves. For example, um, liberal use of Tarof can be used to, uh, by hosts, for example, to portray uh, themselves as, as very hospitable. Um, and, and as we know, usually, uh, the ability on the part of the speaker to, to exercise and to respond to Tarov appropriately has had a significant bearing on their social relationships. Now, in terms of the linguistic enactments of Tarov, um, I'm just referring to a few of them. For example, the cultural scheme of Tarov seems to be associated with the speech act of making a request, for example, when we hesitate to make a request because of Tarof, we want something, but we don't say that because of the kind of reservation that we have that is associated with Tarof. Or when offering goods and services, 
For example, we reject an offer several times, and of course this rejection could be genuine or could be ostensible. And also in terms of invitations, for example, this cultural schema is associated with many invitations, both ostensible and, and genuine invitations that we have. A lot of, as we know, in leave taking in Persian, a lot of times we, we do use invitations, um, but often this is a gesture of tarof and not necessarily a very, very uh, genuine form of invitation. This is just an example. Tarof in offering and accepting goods and services and making ostensible offers. As we know, when you know, friends, in context where friends having food and they offer foods, their, their own foods to each other, and then you know, this can continue in the form of offering and the other person rejecting, offering, insisting on the offer and the other interlocutor rejecting the offer several times. Here, the impolite move would be not to offer, for example, your food um, to your friend. Now, this is where this kind of research on cultural linguistics has significant implication for studies of impoliteness, which is um, the recent trend in studies of politeness. And here I'm referring to the work of people like Michael Hall and Jonathan Culpepper and that group who focus on impoliteness rather than the um, traditional notion of politeness formulated by Brown and Levinson. So here, impoliteness really is so much associated with culture in the form of breach of certain cultural schemas. If, if you breach a particular cultural schema, then you are perceived to be impolite, at least in that instance. The next one is Persian cultural schema of Rudar Bayesti. Well, as we know, this, the word Rudar Bayesti may be glossed in English as face out of obligation. Of course, this is in terms of its morphemes. But it covers a state or feeling of distance between individuals. Of course, this, this feeling of distance could arise from differences in social power or social distance and or the high degree of respect or esteem that one has for another individual. So, for example, this feeling associated with Rudabasi can lead to a feeling of hesitation experienced by the speaker when it comes to enacting a face-threatening act such as refusing an offer or an invitation. This state of distance out of respect, if you like, Rudar Boisti, has a significant bearing on one's behavior towards the other person and the ways in which people represent themselves and present themselves to, to others, such as in showing hospitality. One of my PhD student who recently graduated, Dr. Babai, focused on refusals in Persian and also explored the ways in which refusals in Persian uh, are associated with the concept of Rudar Bayesti. So basically, a very good example is when we refuse um, to, to reject something just because of Rudar YC. So we say, well, I can't reject something. I can't refuse something uh, because I have this feeling of distance out of respect for this person. So you may be invited to go somewhere to a party and, and although you may not want to go, but you hesitate to reject, you basically accept because of this feeling of distance out of respect. 
The next one, maybe called Persian cultural schema of Sheikh Hassan Afsi. Um, the closest concept in English would be modesty and self um, deprecating. As we know, Sheikh Hassan Afsi can be glossed in terms of morpheme to morpheme glossing as breaking one's nafs. We have other words in Persian for it, for example, for utani, which is lowering or dipping or plunging the body. Um, so there's a concept of breaking or lowering the self associated with this cultural schema. This cultural schema encourages individuals to, to restrain any thought or behavior that has an egotistic essence. One of the instantiations of this schema is reflected in cases where a person disagrees with a compliment, tones the compliment down, returns or reassigns the compliment to the complimenter, or to a family member, or to God, or someone else. According to this schema, success and achievement should be viewed in collective terms and not merely as a result of one's efforts and talents and capabilities. In other words, the schema spurns any thought of self-endearment. So the notion of self in this schema becomes really very important. The notion of nafs. As we know, historically, the notion of nafs has occupied a significant place in Persian accounts of spirituality and in the ethos of the social relationships in Persian society. I have done a survey of, of the uses of nafs, which suggests a much wider scope than that of English notion of self. This cultural schema underlies the use of many complement responses in Persian. And I have published a couple of papers showing how um, complement responses in Persian are associated with um, the cultural schema of Sheikh Hassan Abzi. So I've, here I've tried to capture the relationship between the cultural schemas and the speech acts that I've been talking about. So as you can see, here I'm conceptualizing the Rudarbai Sikh cultural schema as underlying the speech act of refusing an offer or an invitation. The second one, um, Sheikh Yastin Afsi cultural schema underlies the enactment of complement responses and apology in offering goods and services. Now, the second one, apology in offering goods and services, the example is when you try to, you have prepared a very nice elaborate meal and you are inviting your guests to come to the table, but you say, uh, and you, you apologize and say, this is not good enough for you, this is not um, up to your steam, you are my, um, you're the crown of my head, and this food is not worthy of you. So this is you apologize for the quality, not because you think it's of low quality, but not as good as the worth of the um, guests. I have tried so far to show how cultural linguistics can be applied to the study of pragmatic meaning by examining certain cultural schemas that underlie certain speech acts, and I've given examples from Persian. So overall, I think cultural linguistics can offer a useful framework, both a theoretical framework and an analytical framework. The analytical framework focuses on the notions of cultural schema, cultural category, and cultural metaphor. 
for examining cultural conceptualizations that underlie the enactment of certain speech acts. What I have been trying to show is that certain cultural schemas represent pools of knowledge that provide a basis for a significant portion of semantic and pragmatic meaning in linguistic interactions, providing a substantial basis for what is perceived to be common ground between the members of a cultural group. And I hope this talk can motivate interest among members of this conference to pursue further studies of pragmatics of Persian in terms of other cultural schemas. Thank you very much. <laughs>